Salutations, respected viewers. I am George from Ireland. So here I am at the final resting place of William Bly, Captain Bly of Mutiny Infamy. So um, William Bly is perhaps uh, one of the uh, most famous British seamen of all time, or infamous, uh, as I earlier said. And um, this is where he lies buried. He's best known for the Mutiny on the Bounty, which took place in uh, 1788. So uh, he was a fairly um, able naval officer, rose up the ranks, didn't come from family that was uh, particularly affluent or well-connected, solidly middle class. And uh, the Royal Navy was a career that was open to talents because uh, those who were aristocratic or very wealthy, if they joined the, the armed forces at all, would have joined the army. And uh, those who are really out of the top drawer joined the, the um, brigade of guards, these guards regiments hanging around London, would still politic, live their social life. The other regiments of the line might actually have to go and fight or just be posted somewhere far distant. But the Royal Navy, they were constantly voyaging around the world. And even in time of peace, fighting pirates, sometimes capsizing or indeed dying of scurvy until they discovered lime juice. So let's see what it has to say about William Bly. Um, and his house was not very far from here, only about half a mile. So sacred to the well memory of William Bly, Vice Admiral of the Blue, because uh, the Royal Navy had a blue fleet, a red fleet and a white fleet. So despite uh, his uh, mishap, he got um, promoted very highly. Um, who first transplanted the breadfruit fr um, tree from Otahiti, as we just say Tahiti these days, to the West Indies and bravely fought battles and all the rest of it. So he died in, 17, in 1817, age 64. So a ripe old age for the time. Life expected to be more like 50 back then. Um, so I won't tell the whole tale. I've told it um, on another occasion. Um, outside his house, which is now a guest house. You can go and stay there. So um, that was a bit of a blind going to get the breadfruit and bring it back to the West Indies to provide um, plenty of comestibles for poor people who were held in servitude there. Um, but it was also to um, stake a claim to Tahiti. They're worried about the French claiming it. But uh, he um, was not an especially harsh um, uh, captain and he reprimanded people when others would have had them flogged. He sometimes had them flagellated when others would have had them put to death. And he had almost life of power, a power of life and death over people. Although sometimes, yes, people could be brought all the way back to London and put on trial here. But um, um, he was overthrown anyway by Fletcher Christian, his former dear friend. And uh, so Captain Bly noticed, notably wasn't killed. His men didn't hate him that much. And um, half the crew was still on his side. And they're put into an open boat with um, very little in terms of food provisions, no maps, things like that. And how on earth were they going to find their way to safety? And uh, he, he'd, he'd um, shouted to Fletcher Christian, sort of, you dangled my children on your knee. And he did. And that's what the fascinating thing about the, the whole story is this the psychodrama where the two men had been firm friends and ended up, um, ended up with this mutiny. So the, the mutiny on the bounty film, there have been five iterations of it. The most recent one, 1981, where there's um, Liam Neeson's first film role. There is um, Dexter Fletcher. I can't think who else there is. Obviously, Anthony Hopkins plays um, Bly, uh, and so, ooh, somebody else famous, the name slips my mind um, temporarily, it'll come back to me. Um, anyhow, so that was that, and the mutineers famously sailed to Pitcairn, an island which the Royal Navy had charted, but they got it wrong. Uh, they'd got it wrong in terms of lines of latitude, but not longitude. It was hundreds of miles further east, if I've got that right, than they thought. And that's where they hit out. But anyway, his wife is buried here too. Appropriate enough, it's got the breadfruit on top. And it's got their little shells. Well, he was a seafaring man. And, um, and then it's got uh, the, the motto, in cello quies, Latin, of course. So um, he kept his log. He got back to the United Kingdom and he gave his account of things. And the Admiralty largely exonerated him. Um, so he couldn't take all his loyalists in his boat with him, uh, his long boat. So um, uh, some of the loyalists were allowed to stay on board by the mutineers and, he's, and, and he shouted to his, his loyal supporters who had to stay on the bounty, don't worry, I'll vouch for you. I remember that you did not participate in this, in this mutiny. So that was that. And um, so the, they were put ashore at Tahiti, those who remained loyal to him. And the Royal Navy came about a year later and some of them ran towards the ship. They were elated. They felt that they felt this was their liberation. But the uh, Royal Naval ship arriving to Tahiti still regarded them as mutineers despite that. And they're all clapped in irons and put uh, below, below deck in a dungeon. And when um, that ship uh, struck, a, struck a reef sometime later, some of them drowned, were not released on time. And those who were released on time got all the way back to London and put on trial before the Admiralty. 
and uh, some of them found guilty and a few of them even executed. Although I think that those that were executed might have actually been real mutineers because some of the mutineers said, okay, just put us aboard in Tahiti, we'll hide out on the hills. Of course, when the Royal Navy came back so a year after the mutiny, the King of Tahiti felt he had to rat them out to the British because he felt if he's seen to be conniving this mutiny, then there will be hell to pay. So that was that. Anyway, uh, what else about Bly? So he, he gave other commands and he, he faced uh, two more mutinies. He was governor of New South Wales colony, as in that's what grew into Australia. And indeed, Anna Bly, an, uh, an Australian politician, she is a descendant of his. So um, uh, one mutiny might be bad luck, so it might be two mutinies, but three mutinies against you looks like carelessness. So uh, he managed to uh, offend his men without actually scaring them. Uh, anyway, so this is a fascinating um, garden museum. There have been up to 20,000 graves here, um, but uh, you know, they've not all been maintained. And obviously the, the um, engravings wear away. They no longer have these, the etchings aren't always clear on them. So they decided to turn it into a garden museum. And it is a scintillating spot just south of the um, River Thames. Uh, look at the, some of the stonework here. Look at that handiwork. They don't do that sort of stuff anymore. Um, and obviously, you know, pollution has, has, has wrecked it. So we're very close to Lambeth Palace, which is the official residence of the Archbishop of Canterbury, because the Archbishop of Canterbury doesn't spend much of his time in Canterbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury being the most um, senior priest in the Church of England. So uh, England, for the purposes of the Anglican Church, is divided into two provinces, the province of York, which is Northern England, and the province of Canterbury, which is Southern England. Uh, although, to some extent, that also includes Wales. So, uh, the famous Tradescant family, they are interred here. And on the floor, I won't show them all to you, their various um, uh, tombs as well. Uh, what else can I say? So, it was well worth paying a visit to, and I'm glad they've done something worthwhile with it, because people scarcely go to church these days. And they've actually made it a bit of a community centre. There's a reason to pop in and see this gorgeous old building. Um, now, what else can I tell you? So I'm just gonna think if anyone else uh, well-known is buried. There's a Miss Coney, if I've got that right, who invented concrete, uh, who's also uh, laid to rest here. Ah, there's an Archbishop of Cornwallis, who was Archbishop of Canterbury. And um, he is, if I got this right, the grandfather of um, uh, Lord Cornwallis, as in of American Revolutionary fame. And indeed he was Lord Lieutenant of Ireland in 1798, at the time of the uh, rebellion. So, um, yeah, you can see more of the tombs here beside this very busy road. And look at this medieval church. Obviously, it's had to be extensively renovated. You can see a difference in stonework. Uh, so, well worth paying a visit, even if you're not that fascinated by gardens. But it's very airy, interactive, a very appealing attraction to visit. It probably wouldn't be the top of your list of things to see in, in London, but don't let it be the bottom either. I'm not someone who cares over much about uh, gardens. Um, and it's hard by the River Thames. We're just on the south bank of the River Thames. Uh, what else would I point out to you? Yes, so there's an inscription here that you'll find difficult to read. I'll show it to you in a moment. But they've obviously tried to update it, like etch it anew, um, about Brian Turberville, later St. James's Westminster, which is just north of the river. There's St. James's Church near St. James's Palace, um, and saying how he and his family, he gave 100 pounds, his family gave 100 pounds to the care of apprentices. Um, to buy them out of their apprenticeship, more or less give them their freedom, but saying that um, no, uh, no um, uh, chimney sweep must benefit from this, or no Roman Catholic, it's a dark grey one up there. So there's a lot of anti-Catholicism at that time. That's from 1711, when the Catholic minority in this country was legally discriminated against. So um, do pay a visit to the uh, Garden Museum. It's uh, charming and scintillating. I think you'll agree.